hot. So afternoon all, we are going to continue today, right? See, we're nearing the end of syllabus, nearing the end of secondary school physics at Cape. Nearly there, almost, almost at the end. For those who want to say yay or nay or whichever, I could not be bothered. Uh, but we're nearly at the end, just like we had our last labs in uniform. Our last labs, our last classes are coming, right? We're nearly, nearly there. So let's go on, continue with where we had stopped last day. All right, so we have, we had done x-rays. We looked at, was the wow for Karina? I see a wow. Oh, oh my goodness. I don't know what emoji that was. I think that's wow. Anyway. All right. So we're going to go on to wave particle duality. Now, remember I said we live in opposite world. Module three and quantum physics is opposite world. Right? As in things are not as they seem in here. Yeah, didn't you read that? Didn't I say that the last day? We live in opposite world right now. Things are crazy up here. All right, so we're going to look at the wave particle duality. All right, so reading from the screen, folks, the reflection and refraction of light have been explained in the terms of light being a wave. As physics students who've been doing physics for three, four years, you're going to be like, well, duh. Obviously, it's a wave. Of course, it could reflect and refract a wave. Furthermore, light can be diffracted and produce interference effects. Well, yeah, we've been doing that for how many years, too? Towards the end of the 19th century, now the end of the 19th century means like 1898, 1899. Yeah? Right? It was shown that all electromagnetic waves propagate at the speed of light in a vacuum. And this was done by Maxwell, right? Um, you all could go and look up on Maxwell, the physicist Maxwell, who showed that light travels at the speed of light, not just light, any electromagnetic wave travels at the speed of light in a vacuum. Hence why one of our base equations in this topic is C is equal to F lambda for any electromagnetic wave that exists in a vacuum, C being our speed of light. Now, if we were to look at Planck's and Einstein's work, we are going to come together and smash our equations, right? Or come and smash our equations together. Yeah, that's, that's the better statement, right? So we're going to have E. We know our first one, E is equal to HF, which is the energy contained by a wave because H is your Planck's constant. F is your frequency of your wave. And then we have all famous E is equal to MC squared, which is um, the energy of an object or energy of a particle traveling close to the speed of light. And we know when things approach the speed of light, mass is converted into energy. All right, now here you're going to realize when it comes to approaching speed of light, these two equations are equal. All right, so if we get these two equations equal, guess what? We can equate them together. And by equating them together, we are going to get HF is equal to MC squared. They don't really look like much right now, but we do know from up here, C is equal to F lambda. Let's put all our things in terms of speeds and wavelengths. Right, because wavelength is a measurement, speed is a measurement, frequency is um, a derived term by one over t. So if I have here f will give me c upon lambda, let's substitute f is equal to c upon lambda inside of here and see what we're going to get. We're going to get h c upon lambda is equal to mc squared. And if we go ahead and make lambda the subject of formula, all right, here's Jabari coming in. All right, if we make lambda the subject of formula, we're going to get lambda is equal to h upon mc. All right, so here the wavelength of 
a wave, now you all get this, the wavelength of our wave, we're talking about a wave here, what we've known straight since form four come up, the wavelength of a wave is equal to Planck's constant by speed of light by mass. Mass? How mass get involved in this? subject where mass comes from as far as we knew or we have always known mass and light usually have nothing to do with each other correct 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 what mass doing in this story where mass come from mass have no place in this story but the mathematics is there it's straight there we can see that by comparing our two or combining our two equations, HF is equal to MC squared, right? And instead of using F, we're going to use C upon lambda because we want measurement um, quantities. We're going to get lambda is equal to H upon MC. And let's even whittle this down further to the terms that we know of. MC, guys, is mass by speed of light, right? Even though it's right here, I know that mass by velocity is equal to momentum. All right? We've learned that from form four, coming up the road, all, you know, our entire physics, right? Or probably even did it in form three. Well, if I was teaching on form three, you would have learned it in form three. All right? So we have here MC, which is mass by speed of light, is still, even though it's speed of light, is the momentum of an object. So we're talking about light has a momentum, huh? Light does have a momentum, right? Light does carry energy forward. And since mass can be converted to energy, we can make that statement of light having a momentum or electromagnetic waves having a momentum. So what we're gonna come up with here we're going to come to the equation of, since mass, mc is mass by velocity, that's going to give us a momentum relationship. And I know the symbol, or we know the symbol for momentum is equal to p. So lambda, which is the wavelength of an electromagnetic wave, is equal to h upon momentum. And this is coil, this is not de Broglie equation. This is not English, it's pronounced differently. So this is called the de Broglie, kind of like the, kind of like de Broglie. That's how you kind of pronounce it, All right? So the de Broglie equation, it's not English, so it doesn't pronounce exactly like that. All right, so the de, Bro de Broglie equation, 100% links waves, and particles together because we can see that particles do have a wave-like nature and waves have a particle-like nature. This sounds a bit weird, but this has been proven that some particles do exhibit wave-like properties. Anybody ever heard of the electron microscope? Yeah, about like two seconds yeah, ago. <laughs> the electron microscope, why am I spelling that strange? I'm spelling it weird, right? The electron microscope is a microscope that uses electrons to view into an object or to magnify an object just as we use regular um, optical microscopes. It's the most powerful microscope that we have so far. So if you've ever seen a photograph of an atom, if you all have ever seen a photograph of atomic shells, that comes straight from an electron microscope. Why? Because light is not small enough. You all think about this. Light is not small enough to peer into an atom for us to be able to make out structures in the atom. So we need something smaller than light. What's smaller than light? Electrons are smaller than light. So what you're thinking, well, yeah, light's small. No, no, no. In terms of the atom, a light is very, very huge. Light, if you had to compare light to looking at the structures in an atom, 
it would be like us using um, a very, very tiny hole in our card. So say I had a card like this. Okay, I have my international vaccination card. Suppose I poked a little, if you all look at the camera, or I poked a little hole in, hole in this card and I use this hole to look at the universe around me. It's not going to be enough, right? So the, um, or vice versa, suppose I use this little tiny hole and I'm using my eye to look through this hole. Not possible because my eye has a bigger range than what the hole is offering. So what do we do? You have to use something that's smaller and finer to go through or to peer through this hole. All right, same thing happens. An um, electron is smaller. If you all ever read up, go and read up the dimensions of an electron, meaning the size of an electron. You know, we've spoken about the charging of electron, the mass of an electron, but we've never really looked at the diameter and the dimensions of an electron. All of these things that, wow, yeah, I don't even know it. I think I, I just stuck myself there. I don't know the dimensions of an electron. Electrons are really small, they're smaller than the wavelength of light and light when it comes to wavelengths is not that small because light is on average what about 600 nanometers 600 nanometers is 0.6 of a micrometer there is smaller than that you all know there is smaller than that in terms of values all right and sizes so this is where they realize that they can use particles to act as waves because some particles, especially small particles, do have wave like manners and properties to them. So let's continue reading. Right? From this equation, it was evidence that the momentum of a particle will have a wavelength. This is like, again, remember we live in an opposite world right now. When it comes to very, very small classical physics breaks down, right? Because things don't work the way they work at very small levels. Um, only matter can have a momentum since it has a mass. It was De Broglie who first proposed that matter can have wave-like properties associated with them. This can be seen in electron diffraction and interference patterns. So you all can look this up, right? They look exactly like regular interference patterns. If you, uh, we know what interference patterns look like. We know diffraction patterns look like. Right, but they have diffracted and interfered. Um, that doesn't sound right, but whatever. They have diffracted and had inf interference with electrons. They've experimented with it and they've shown it. It is electron diffraction that has led to the development of the electron microscope. And beyond the electrons being um, used for microscopes, they've also realized that neutrons, protons, hydrogen, and helium can also be diffracted. So we can also diffract and observe wave-like properties of hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium is matter. The very base foundation blocks of the universe have wave-like properties to it. Neutron diffraction is used in the study of crystal structures. Now, I'm pretty sure you all, especially in chemistry, would have seen very, very magnified, hugely, mag um, yeah, hugely magnified images. Um, who is messaging us right now? Okay. All right. Huge magnified images of like crystal structures where they look like big blocks and whatnot. They don't use an optical microscope all the time for that. When they want to go further down and more precisely down into an atom or into a structure, we have to use the diffraction of smaller materials, smaller quantities. All right. Um, I think I was supposed to mention something else here. I forget. All right. So that's your electron microscope. Now, what is our big application of this? All right, this is the breaking block. This is the piece that if they figure this out properly, they will be able to do. You all have heard about this. Ever heard of teleportation? That's like impossible. No, it's not. What is teleportation? Let's get this down to basic science. Right, as CAPE students, you all could understand this now since we live in opposite world in module three. Teleportation 
is the conversion of an object into an electrical signal and we transport that electrical signal to somewhere else and then that signal is recombined right that electrical signal which is essentially a wave because they send it through space right it's not like they're sending electrons out in space they send it via electromagnetic wave infrared microwave uv something they send it via um, an electromagnetic wave, and then they recombine those wave signatures to create a solid body. So we used to always think, but how are we doing that? Humans on waves, what, what, what? Yeah, it's right here. The physics is here. This is where they came up with it. This is how they realized. Um, of course, this is really extreme. They realized that objects with a mass have wave-like properties. So that means it's possible to convert mass into a wave and vice versa. We can take that wave and recombine it and, com and get mass. So it sounds like hard, far-fetched science, but we've done it. If you believe it or not, we've actually up, um, achieved teleportation out of really, really small things, right? Of light particles, so they've, what they've done, they took a photon of light, even though it starts small, you all remember, we had to start with the most foundation, fundamental block of matter, right? They took a photon of light, and photon of light obviously has E is equal to F, H. You get our frequency, you get our energy. And we know that lambda is equal to H upon your momentum. They have converted this light particle, this photon of light, completely converted it. They got the, the wave signature, right? They digitized that wave signature perfectly. And they broke this down into strictly waves. It passed through a cable or they sent it via a cable and then through um, an electromagnetic wave and they recombined it somewhere else. Right? How did they recombine it? They just got these waves. They saw how these waves matched up and they recombined it in that exact same matter, manner. Now, they've done more than light. I think they've done atoms by now. They've done atoms either parts of an atom. While this is simple or this is easy for a very small objects, so let's think about it. an electron will have its own wave signature. A proton will have its own wave signature um all the subatomic particles the dozens of sub subatomic particles will have their own wave signatures so it might be easy to digitize these and turn every single particle into their comedy into their accompanying wave but then we have to recombine them properly that's the hard part all right and you know what's going to be able to make this possible really 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 advanced computing called quantum computing. So this is why I said, when they break open this quantum field topic, as in right now, we're just standing on the edge. We are, we are reaching anywhere yet to understand quantum or to understand the whole realm of quantum physics. We're right on the edge. When somebody breaks that boundary, all of this is going to be possible. All of it, because we'll understand how to get the kind of computers and the signals and the and the machinery and the tech to recombine our waves. So we have it on maths. The maths is there like always. We just don't have the tech because it was um, 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 Newton who came up with the equations that made, us pos made it possible to leave the planet. This was in 15, 1400s, 1500s. We only took like till 1950s to get the technology to leave the planet. So this is technically where we are at. We are Newton. We have the maths. We understand it. We just don't have the technology as yet. But we'll get there. But I don't want to be Newton. I want to experience it. Well, you know what? It's coming fast and furious because we already have more tech than before. Remember, he had this whole big block. They didn't have electronics as yet. They didn't even have electricity as yet. All right, and look how fast they move from the 19, from the 1850s 
plain electricity, just with, you know, taking two chemicals and sparking them with um, elect electrodes. So then within 20, 40, 30 years, they had electricity passing through wires to feed houses, right? And then within so many years, all right? Look, they just went on. We just flew our first helicopter on another planet. That happened last week, week before. First, first time. 100 years or 120 years since we first flew on the planet Earth with a machine, we are now flying objects, flying helicopters on other planets remotely. All right, just, just flew our first helicopter on Mars. If you all were reading it up and looking it up, just happened. So, yeah, so it. All right, so same thing happens for tech. Once we break a tech technology barrier, it just floods, floods and floods and floods because. There's so much things going on. Not to say it's hidden because all of these are open source. All right. It's not as hidden as just nobody knows. To, they don't really care to go and look it up, but it's there. All right. Just like how China fired up their tokamak a couple months ago, and that was big, big news. But not everybody knows what a tokamak is. All right. They don't realize how much that is going to change our future. Once we get good, nice, economical tokamaks running. What's a tokamak again? Anybody remember? We talked about that. Yeah, we did talk about a tokamak. That's our fusion reactors, right? And remember I told you, once we get fusion reactors off the ground, energy, um, how we use energy on the planet, Earth is going to change. How we utilize our resources is going to change. But in the meantime, we're not quite there yet. All right, same thing. You won't believe we're on the cusp of everything right now. Just on the board of everything right now. All right, we have particles traveling at the speed of light to the point where they travel so fast and they interact, they, it appeared to move faster than speed of light. So we broke, it appeared that we broke a fundamental law of the universe up here. Eh? up here but we didn't <laughs> all right so moving on nuclear energy let me see how much we could finish today yeah we could finish a fair bit today so going on to nuclear energy so we have the mass energy relationship mass energy relationship all right we just know we know that mass and energy are directly related to each other whether it be in classical physics forms classical physics being half of mv squared being mgh classical physics or um half k x squared for your springs all right we this is our classical form of physics we do know this and now when we come to non-classical or quantum physics section we do know that mass and energy are still related to each other but in a different format so let's continue reading and see what we have when einstein developed his relativity theories one of the most famous equations was born, E is equal to mc squared. Yo, you know in his paper, nowhere in his paper did he actually mention the equation E is equal to mc squared. Nowhere. It was never in the paper. This was somebody who pulled it out and reported that this is what he was talking about. In his original paper, never did Einstein write this himself. He said it in words, but he didn't say it in an equation this um this simply. Our, li our lives are lies. They're all lies. <laughs> Einstein never said this in his paper, never. Right? But that's what it came out of it when you broke it down to the simplest terms, E is equal to mc squared. But this is actually not the proper equation because we know m here is not regular mass. m is your mass defect in an atom. Right? Your mass defect in the atom, you're looking at your mass changing from master energy so that means when your mass starts to decrease that is when it converts to energy so it's not to say if you or we take a 10 kilogram object and we accelerate to the speed of light this is the energy it's going to get no the mass of the, that object is going to convert to a wave as you all just see we can take a mass and convert it to a wave and then we can find the energy of that wave that is what this is actually saying so let's continue reading Mass and energy are directly related and can be considered to be equivalent to each other. Mass and energy is 
basically the same thing when we're talking about nuclear physics and we're talking about this microscopic level of physics in quantum physics is the same thing. In nuclear physics, mass is measured in unified atomic mass units. We all should remember this. This is the mass of one twelfth of a C12 atom or essentially or nearly the mass of a proton. Very, very, very nearly the mass of a proton. Why do I say the mass of a proton? Because one twelfth of a C12 atom, actually no, it's a neutron, sorry. It'll be the mass of a neutron. Let's see why we have this working out that way. A neutron, you all know neutrons are slightly heavier, really, really slightly heavier than a proton. And a C12 atom, a pure C12 atom is simply an atom that has six protons, six neutrons, and six, and it'll be 12, not 12, it'll be six electrons, right? You all know that the mass of an electron is much, 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 much smaller than either proton or neutron, so I don't know, it doesn't really add up too much. So if you want one twelfth of these two, it's essentially going to be the mass of one neutron, essentially the mass of one neutron. I'm not saying it is, right? But if you want to kind of make an approximation for well, the mass of a neutron, and one unified atomic mass is 1.66 by 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Remember, we use atomic, unified atomic masses to substitute into values because it's easy to say to you, for you, right, add them or to multiply by C versus going and say 2.354961 by 10 to the minus 27. Which one is going to be easier, y'all? Using the U's or using these small little numbers? Small little numbers, All right? Easy to go and get, make a mistake when you're using your full mass because it's a very small particle and we have very small masses and mass differences involved. So to save us the trouble of making mistakes, which is what we always do, please use U when necessary, all right? It's easy to go and multiply by the U, and at the end of the day, you just divide, you multiply by the 1.6 by 10 to minus 27, and you get nice, perfect answers. So please use them, all right? Here, we're gonna do a little bit of maths. I hope you all go ahead and try this when we get out of class, all right, with your calculator. So I see, Let's continue. By using E is equal to MC squared, we can show that one U is equal to 931 mega electron volts. This is a conversion you all have to learn because this is the energies that we use in nuclear energy will be in terms of mega electron volts, all right? So you all have to know how to convert. And as we said, mass and, and energy are interchanged topics, right? We can use one for the next. So let's see how we can do our conversion from kilograms to mega electron volts. All right, so I have here, get your calculators out if it's nearby, please, so you all can give it a try. Who knows? This might actually be a question. We will see in um, six days. All right, what, do, what our questions are going to be, if it'll be any kind of useful tips. All right, so using E is equal to MC squared. Um, remember we said, if you want to get, if our energy, energy and mass are interchanged topics, right? So if my energy is one a unified atomic mass, all right, let's see what is the energy equivalent of one unified atomic mass. So it's going to be mass, right, of one, u, which is 1.66 by 10 to minus 27, multiply by c squared. And when you multiply that, you're going to get 1.494 by 10 to minus 10 joules. We know that V is equal to E upon Q. Voltage is equal to um, energy over charge. All right, so if I have my energy and I have my charge, I can get my voltage. Why am I talking about voltage? Where how voltage jump in the story in the story? 
And we were talking about energy just now. So where did voltage come from? Anybody? You all remember this? Isn't voltage a measure of your energy? Isn't voltage um, the amount of work done in moving one joule of energy from one point to infinity? You all remember that from module one? Yeah. All your topics are going to mix up together now. That's a nice thing about unit two, as in, that's a nice and bad thing about unit two. All your topics combine together to give us one smushed up topic. So here, voltage is also a measure of energy. So we're gonna have here, we know V is equal to E upon Q and V is also energy. So you're gonna have um, one U, is equal to 1.494 by 10 to the minus 10 divided by our energy, our electron charge. And we are going to end up getting 931 mega electron volts. But how, where will that come from? Remember 931 mega will be 931 by 10 to the six, or if you want 9.31 by 10 to the eight. Get your calculators and see if it works out that way. We'll pause for a couple seconds and see those who have calculators, give it a check and see. You'll get that? Look it on and see. Good, Andy. Anybody else? We'll have calculators on them. Ibrahim, I'll take static as a yes. <laughs> Anyone else? You'll give it a try. Remember, you have to try these because, again, practice and using the calculator. And Working on the numbers. It's called muscle memory too. All right, so when you work these out, you will end up getting um, 931 mega electron volts or 9.31 by 10 to the eighth. Same thing. All right, so let's resume the recording. Yes. Yeah. I just love it how you are fighting Jedi is dancing while teaching you. <laughs> well, I wasn't doing anything. You see R2, my father there, he was doing all right, all. right. <laughs> right. He's a true hero of Star Wars, you know. R2D2. R2D2 is a true hero. The humans are just the plebs. <laughs> right? <laughs> Honestly, yeah. They were just waving a laser sword all over like well, I don't know what it's doing. All right, R2, I, I swear R2 was a, a Jedi, you know, think about it, he could fly, he could cause things to move across, right, he could control how things moved, even though that was electronics and computers, right, so folks, um, you all have a good afternoon, all right, enjoy the rest of your day, you can probably go back and sleep, because it's nice and rainy and cool, all right, and continue reading, continue revising, Again, um, since I will have to record the video, I'll post up the video. And since it'll be more than an hour, it might probably be an entire hour and something video that's to wrap up the entire syllabus. So we can continue or start doing tutorials and revisions.
All right, so let me stop the recording. Stop the recording.